is an issue that if left to its own devices, those wolves will be gone and Steve will no longer be a rancher. Washington officials to cancel a series of open houses to talk about wolves. The debate over how to manage wolves has spurred something of a culture war in the Pacific Northwest. The wolf population is still growing under protections from state and federal law. In the meantime, another number that is also growing is the number of conflicts with cattle, especially here in eastern Washington. Killing wolves was a glorified profession. Hunters, trappers, ranchers, they did that with such a zeal that, you know, by the 1930s, wolves were just eradicated from the landscape. That was kind of the, the nail in the coffin for wolves in this state for the last hundred years. And it was more of a recent development that they've been solidly um, coming back into the state and establishing strong populations. That's primarily the catalyst that moved me east, and that's why I ended up out here doing what I'm doing. Get a good scratch, get a good scratch. You did good today, you did good. I'm a hunter and I'm a fisher, but more than anything, I'm a conservationist. I'm an activist who feels spiritually connected to the landscape. I was just so full of joy when I knew that wolves had returned at the Kettle Range. When I heard howling up there, which meant they were socializing, it was just wonderful. It just felt like this place is wild again. It's like it's returning. The landscape thrives on balance. And if you don't have predators, the, the balance is disrupted. There were some people that were really unhappy when wolves rebounded here. Some ranchers, I wouldn't say even the majority of them, just some ranchers raised a lot of uh, stink about it. And they demanded the Department of Fish and Wildlife do something about it, and uh, the wolves don't belong here. In other words, there ain't enough room for the both of us in this one-horse town. driven out of this region in the 1930s by homesteaders and ranchers. But it wasn't until Labor Day weekend of 2007 in this spot right here on the Diamond M Ranch that wolves returned, killing two calves, the first documented kill in Washington in decades. The old homesteaders knew they had to control the wolf. Man versus predator is age old. The good Lord put us here and the animals here and said we're to have dominion over them. Mm -hmm. 
2008 or 2009, we had our first confirmed kill. First one in the state of Washington mm -hmm. since the mid-30s. And then basically every year since, it's kind of progressed worse. We know we've had 500 head killed by wolves in the last 10 years. Wolves generally attack on the back end of a calf. Massive wolf bites uh, here on both legs. If we give them all this fancy title, but a wolf is a wolf, they're a killing machine. And if we were allowed to get a shot at them, whenever we see them, uh, cattlemen would be able to take care of their own problems. A lot of the ranchers out here are having a hard time accepting wolves on the landscape. Can't have them out there eating my cows, so a box of bullets is what I know, and that's what my grandpa knew, and that's what I'm gonna do. And a lot of that generationally ingrained mentality still exists today because nobody's taken the time to offer a better solution. Uh, we're standing above a den right now. This is the Mexican gray wolf's den. There's one pup in here, and then there's three pups actually in here. All my 20s I spent working with wolves in captivity. There's something special about being within a few feet of a wolf. For me, it just goes deep into your soul and kind of opens up that wild part that's still in us. Working with wolves in captivity for all my 20s kind of led me to a point of really feeling like I need to help the bigger picture. So as a range rider, I work all year long to help prevent wolves from looking at cows as a food source. And cows are obviously an easy meal when they're out here and there's nobody watching after them. So the whole point of me being out here is to make sure that wolves never learn that behavior in the first place. Historically, being a shepherd, you'd kill any predator that would potentially be a danger to your flock or your herd. And now as a range rider, I use only non-lethal mitigation methods to accomplish that same goal of keeping my herd and flock safe. So I'm driving down now to meet with Steve. He's the rancher that I'm working with up on this uh, public land grazing allotment. When I do some preseason scouting, he's always been thankful because it's just a no-brainer. It makes sense to find out what's on the landscape and what's going on out there before his cows are ever out there. Hey, Steve. Good to see you. How you been? How'd you winter? Wolves up there yet? Wolf scat, yeah. Freshest wolf scat that I found was uh, up on the junction there. So there's definitely some activity, but I'll be in there throwing pressure on them, you know, getting back up in the hills. So. When you protect wolves the way they're doing here, then they're a problem. We know if you protect them and let them become overpopulated, they attack cattle. And so now we need something to make it stop happening. Range riders, We'll see how effective that goes, but my goal would be to stay in business and uh, keep the wolves from getting themselves in trouble. This is an issue that if left to its own devices, those wolves will be gone and Steve will no longer be a rancher out here. He has his, his whole culture here. This is, you know, his whole family here. There's history here. My great-grandfather came in 1884 and homesteaded about a mile from here. Small ranches seldom last four generations. Knowing that my son admires what I do and is good at it, I see him and myself. It's a good feeling. We've been here 100 years. We can get along. Our beef feeds a lot of people, 
but will the economy allow us to maintain ownership and keep producing or will we be crowded out? Just coming out of winter, we got to get the cows out of the feedlots and get them out on grass. There's not much rest for the weary. Come on, load up, load up. Come on, take it through. Move to the front of the bus. The main thing that keeps us in business are the Forest Service ranges. They'll spend from June 1st till October 1st up on National Forest. They're starting to think that the cows are too detrimental. They're having too hard of an impact on the land for all these endangered species that they want to establish up here. The bull trout habitat and the grizzly bear habitat and the caribou and the wolves. If they close the range, they're closing my ranch. I like Daniel. Um, when you first meet him, is Daniel gonna see this? Because when you first meet him, you think, dude, you need a haircut and a bath. <laughs> when you live out with cattle, he reminds me of a mountain man, something I haven't seen. You know, the stories, the pictures from years ago. Daniel, Daniel's the real deal. Wolves by nature are very elusive animals. Typically you don't see them out in the wild. Tracks and scat and other forms of sign are my main forms of interaction with these animals. This scat's comprised of wild deer hair, so what that means to me is that they're actually living like wolves should, eating wild prey. So wolves are uh, watching my every move, so that's kind of the importance of being out here on a constant basis make sure that human presence is always there. And by doing that, I disrupt their behavior. I make it uncomfortable for them to travel these roads at night or to go inside cattle-rich areas. I came up 10 years ago, becoming the first contracted range rider in the state of Washington. It was never motivated by money. And it's never been able to be about money. To do this right, you have to really 
dump a lot of resources into it. Um, not just your time, not just your energy, but a lot of monetary resources go into this. And the funding is so irregular usually. I just don't know if I have a job every winter, basically. I have to struggle to try and make sure that the animals that I ask to come out here are fed. I need to always prove the efficacy of my work and to show that this is needed and to talk to nonprofits to try and solicit funding from them. It's because it's still in its nascent stage. This is still being proven. Like, I know it works. The ranchers that I'm honored to be able to work with, they know it works but we have a lot of resources being dumped into areas and we're still seeing wolves killed there. And that makes people question how, how important is that job? In the past month, wildlife officials have shot six wolves from a helicopter in Northeast Washington state. The alpha male seen here in this King 5 video was captured and collared in July. Then wildlife officials used that same radio signal to track and kill him, along with five other members of his pack, after they killed 17 cows and calves from the Diamond M Ranch. There are endangered wolves being killed in Washington. I mean, they're being shot by ranchers, but mostly they're being killed by the very department, Department of Fish and Wildlife that is charged with recovering the species in Washington State. I mean, after they have spent all the taxpayer money to collar them, then they go and hire a helicopter and go out and kill the whole family to protect some, you know, below cost, subsidize, grazing operation. The land that Diamond M is grazing their cows on, that's the people's land. It's public land, it's national forest. Diamond M wants to be able to decide exactly how they're gonna manage their operation. They don't want anybody else to tell them what to do. But then they can turn right around and tell the state, go out there and kill those animals for the good of all. Wolves are very dangerous, especially right now where they have no fear of man. When I was a little kid, I could walk anywhere I wanted around here. Now I don't really want my kids or my wife walking around here at all. I mean, it's, it's a very real threat. The people that call themselves wolf lovers, animal lovers, they want to save the wolf that does more damage to animals than anything. I can't even understand it. I don't know. As far as stopping the wolves from killing cattle once they start, there's only one way, and that's lethal removal. They talk about range riders and human presence. Absolutely ineffective. I think that successful range riding is a threat to ranching organizations because it does show that you can have wolves and livestock out on the range and not have problems. They don't want coexistence. They want those carnivores gone. It'd be easier to not do the right thing and not get heckled or not get accosted at just going to get gas at the grocery store. And that happens pretty much just because, generally speaking, people don't want wolves out here. It's like, oh, what, are you not on our side, you know? You're not, you're not all for the, the killing of them? You, you're gonna try and coexist? That's a bunch of shit. I've had people drive up to my camp that I'm pretty sure knew as a range rider and they were gonna do something at 3 a.m. until I walked out there with my boxers and my gun in my hand.
I'm at the point now where I'm really gauging personally, like, you know, is this, is this something that you still really want to do and believe in? Daniel Curry is one of the best range riders that I've ever met. The successful range riders, they definitely get criticized for it. I, I mean, I really feel for him because he cares a heck of a lot. And I think that's an essential part of being a good range rider is you have to care about wolves too. We've all seen the picture of a full moon and a big old wolf up howling. Some of these satanic rites use that image and, and this sort of mentality. I know there's a satanic influence involved in these people that call it, that say they're animal lovers or animal worshipers. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, yeah. Where's your buddy, huh? Growing up, it was kind of a difficult time for myself and just my family. It was, um, you know, we grew up pretty poor, pretty dirt poor, so that was part of it. And, you know, a single mom, she had to work a job and she was raising two kids. Once my brother left, I was home alone a lot, so well, not alone, but with animals. I started just having a bond with animals early on there and really uh, just has grown since then. Sweet girl, too. Yeah. <laughs> Almost all the horses that are here on this property that work with me and that are part of my family have been saved from slaughter. Without them, it wouldn't even be, yeah, it wouldn't be me, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looking at the little baby right there. <laughs> Talk to you later. You listen to your mom. Then you listen to your mom. That's why, I mean, I work so hard too, is I'm trying to give back, and they've taught me a tremendous amount of how to be a better human. I just heard a wolf howl. Right in that tree line. We're surrounded by wolves right now. Wow, that's amazing. Kind of want to go see them though, so we're going to go towards them. Daniel loves what he does, and loving what you do makes you better at it. It's one thing to love the idea of range riding and getting out and seeing the cows. It's something else to actually love the job of intervening with wolves and cattle. He follows the cattle, follows the wolves, and he makes a buffer between them. If you keep the wolves away from the cattle, you will stop depredations, and then there won't be need for lethal action against the wolves. I've been impressed with what Daniel does on my range. The thing that worries me about the wolves is that they're coming to the conclusion that the wolves are more important than the cattle, and I don't have another place to put my cattle. So if the politics go that way and they remove the cattle from these national forest ranges, that hurts me, so I'm more scared of that than I am actually the wolves killing them.
Welcome to Roundup. It's October 21st. Our cattle have been up on the National Forest grazing allotment all summer and still have a few out. I'm trying to pick up the stragglers. <sighs> there we go. <laughs> it's hard to get out of a warm truck sometimes. I forgot my fancy stick, so I had to pick one. It's important to pick a good one. Oh, I tried it. Hey, look at that. We're gonna have good luck today. <laughs> you can see that they make a habit of traveling through here. Sometimes it works to call them. <laughs> you can make fun of this. Come boss! Come on! We lucked out this morning and the bull is right in the middle, just over that little hump. 90% of the job is finding him. Now that I found him, I'm pretty sure I'll bring him home today. Hey, come on. Stay on the road. Man. Come on, fella. The success of the day right there. <laughs> Got that bull three and a half miles down the road and load him up, take him home. End of roundup. Calling that one a win. So I used to think the best solution from my ignorant perspective was to just not have ranching on public lands. I mean, I moved up here for that, that love and that fondness of wolves. And beyond fondness, I mean, it's a connection that I can't even really put into words. Uh, and now I have connection with the ranching community out here. I had never you know, shook hands with the rancher. I'd never watched how hard of the work they do. I'd never had known a family like I've known now. And it's a connection that we're lacking in so many ways. You can see it all over the world. The wars that we fight, the way that we lump each other into uh, categories. When we can maybe stop looking at each other as like maybe Democrats and Republicans and find the common ground that we tend to not look at because I think sometimes we're afraid that if we admit that there's another way or that you don't have to look at life in the way that you have been, that it's a failure and that's not, it's not for me at least.